Robin from Chief of Staff in the President's Office of Honor Buying. And on behalf of President Kendall, I want to welcome you here today. She is preparing for um, giving testimony down at the State House in front of the Senate Finance Committee, so she's unable to be here this morning, um, but wanted me to give a warm welcome on her behalf. So this morning, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Jay Martin. Um, to speak here with the Ross Leadership Institute. Jay is the winningest coach in college men's soccer history with a total of 640 wins. Do I have that? No. More than that. That's what I thought. I thought this might I'll, be old. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll straighten it out later. Great, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2011, Martin guided Ohio Wesleyan to its second NCAA Division III National Championship. Along the way, the Bishops extended their unbeaten string and NCAC competition to league record. 40 games. Um, another peak in Martin's already illustrious co coaching career came when he guided the battle in Bishops in the 19, to the 1998 NCAA Division III Championship. His teams have reached the NCAA Division III semifinals eight times, finishing as national runner-up twice in addition to the 1998 and 2011 titles. They brought home an amazing 12 regional titles, including nine in the last 15 seasons that the NCAA tournament included a regional format. Ohio Wesleyan holds the NCAA three division, uh, division three record with 36 playoff appearances, and that might have increased as well, and has reported 59 playoff victories. So um, you have his full bio. He is here to talk to us about leadership by connecting. We're very pleased to have Dr. Jay Martin with us today. Please join me in giving him a warm Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't like it when you clap before I speak, because I haven't done anything. I want you to clap. If it's any good, you clap at the end, and that'll tell me what's going on. Um, the, I'm, I just finished my 38th year at Ohio Wesleyan University as a professor in physical education. First eight years, soccer and lacrosse. The last 30 years, soccer only. Um, and in 2011, as you heard, we were in San Antonio in the Final Four. Um, and we played Montclair State from New Jersey on, um, on Friday night. And in the stands were 78 of my former players who took their own dime, their own time to fly down. They didn't know anybody on the current team, but they came down to watch the guys play. We beat Montclair 4-0, I think, in that area. And the next day, over 30 other guys flew down for the, for the championship game. So we had over, over 100 former players who flew in um, to share the experience with the, with the, with the current team. And um, as you'll see here in a second, uh, when we won the championship on Saturday night, all of our players ran across the field and they jumped into the stands with the alums and they celebrated together. And I was on the opposite side of the field watching and my wife came up to me and she said, Jay, you see, this is what you do. It's got nothing to do with soccer, but this is what you do. And it dawned on me that what we have at Ohio Wesleyan is something special in the soccer program. Um, and so I started giving it some thought and trying to figure out why and how this happened. Uh, Paul Ate invited me to speak at the leadership uh, symposium in April of 12, I think, April of 212. And so what I've come up with after talking to many of our players and thinking and looking back, I've come up with this leadership by, by connecting. Let's see what we have. Let's see this right to Wall, and he just blasted it into the corner. Now on the wing, this is the championship of yeah, Uchi. Shot to the corner! Shot. Wow! Bucci bending the ball over the top of Michael Tolkien. Angle. That was just a brilliant shot for him. <laughs> the Iowa has their first national championship in 13 years. Just a great, great job tonight. Uh, shutting down a, a, a come from behind attempt there from Kyle. Okay, so they're jumping into the, into the stands. And as I said, it was a special moment for me, and of course, all, as all you husbands know out there, it took your wife to figure it out, and that's, that's, how, it, that's how it is. Um, um, and I want to tell you that I think this process is e evolving, and it never stops moving forward. For example, and I haven't had time to put this into the PowerPoint. For example, 
Eight sophomores were on this team who saw action in the championship game. So one would think that the next two years we had some experience to do this again, right? Because we talk about that all the time in sports, experience. Well, what I figured out, because the next two years we lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament, what I figured out is they, they didn't have any experience. They don't have experience. Because, and I don't know if it's true with you guys, because once a game is over for these guys, they forget it, really. And they move on to whatever's next. So we've added what we call homework, after every game now, the players have to turn in uh, a typed paper to me, one page, what went right, what went wrong, what can we do next time to get better, both as a team and as an individual. Um, and the guys love it. I thought it was going to be kind of irritating for them, but they love it. And what I'm learning is that the guys are starting to think Globally, they started to think about the team, not only themselves, but about the team, and what the team is doing, what we have to do next game to get better, and so on. Measure my teams not so much with wins and losses, but how much fun I had, because when I stop having fun, I'm out. And I can honestly say that I've had more fun this year with this group of guys than any other team probably in the last 12 or 15 years. Playing for Coach Jay, is, it's been awesome. It's, it's why we come here. It's why every alumni, if you ask any alumni who's graduated in the last three or five years, because that's how long he's been here, we all choose to come to Ohio Wesleyan to play for him. It's been amazing. Uh, coach Jay is uh, an unbelievable guy. He is a great coach on the field, um, but also off the field. He, he's terrific as well. You never go unnoticed by him. I think my style can be summarized very simply. It's my job, I think, to create an environment in which my guys can get better. So the environment has to be one that's motivating, it has to be challenging, and above all, it has to be fun. Okay, um, <clears throat> that was with NBC, and uh, they wouldn't let the players call me Jay, and so they made the players say Coach Jay, but as you'll see in a minute, nobody calls me Coach and nobody calls me Coach Jay, my name's Jay, all right? So let's talk about what's going on. Our environment is all about us and we. We have very few rules on the team, in fact, we don't have any. But we do not allow players coming in to talk about their high school or club experiences because it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. And all freshmen want to come in and they want to impress the big boys and they want to tell them how well they did in high school, how well they did in club, how many goals they scored or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's not I. It's all, it's all about us. Um, when I give this talk or similar talks, this is the foundation of my philosophy of coaching. Um, I'm adamant about this. I don't think coaches develop players. In fact, I know coaches don't develop players. The problem is most coaches think they develop their kids. To be, if they have an All-American, they think oh, it's me. I, I know a, a former classmate that has on his business card the, the, the head coach for Peter Vermes, who's an MLS player. It's on his business card. So what he's telling us is Peter Vermes is in the ML, MLS right now because of me. It's not right. Only players can develop players. Only your employees can get better. You can't make them better. Every young man that comes to Ohio Wesleyan has to change the way he plays. That's how it is because it's another, another level, right? So to me, teaching and coaching is a two-way street. He has to want to change, that's motivation, and I have to have the ability to help him change. I can't change him. And so I believe firmly that my job is to create an environment in which the players can change. Part of that, yes, is the coaching. But the environment includes Ohio Wesleyan, our soccer facility, which is very, very nice, uh, the teammates, we go to Germany every three years as a team. All of these things are part of the environment. What the player gets out of it is up to the player. And that's very, very important. And when I'm recruiting a young man, I tell them that up, up front. So if that young man comes to me as a junior and says, Jay, why aren't I playing? I'll say, Joe, that's a great question. Tell me why you're not playing. Well, the reason is he's not doing what he has to do to get on, to get on the field. It's very, very simple, all right? The environment, I've already talked about that. Uh-oh, all right. Um, the old environment, as I said on that clip, has to be motivating, challenging, and fun. Um, I believe that the only place players get better 
is in practice. A lot of coaches believe that, you know, players get better in a game, and that's not true. In a game, play, players will, will practice, I'm sorry, will try to duplicate what they've learned in practice. And then we evaluate it, and we go back to practice, and we start again. Did this work? Did that work? And so on. I'm anal, as you'll see in a few moments, about practice. I, it takes me longer to create a practice plan than, than the training session itself. I'm anal about it. It's the most important time for the player and coach relationship. So what's your environment in your workplace? Is it fun? Is it motivating? Is it challenging? Are your work is getting better? Leadership Council. We started this some time ago. The, the, the Leadership Council is made up of the captains and an elected representative from each class. We meet every Monday, and the council is a conduit between the players and me. Not that my door is closed, it's never closed, but some of the players, especially freshmen, are intimidated by me doing all these things, and so it's better for them. Not only does the council work serve as a conduit, um, but we ask the council every single week, how are we doing? How do you feel physically? How are training sessions going? We've got a big week coming up. What do you think we have to do? Player input from the beginning. If there's a problem on the team, if, if there's a problem, um, the council takes care of it. You know, as a coach, uh, one of the biggest issues you deal with all the time is the star quarterback screwing up, right? And now it's up to the coach. What is the coach going to do with the quarterback? Is the coach going to suspend him, kick him off the team, what have you? And I, I will tell you that uh, coaches can't win in that situation. Regardless of what happens, you lose. So what we came up with, the council, listen to what I'm saying, the players. What, what we came up with, we have a, we have uh, this, uh, uh, document that the council came up with that lists all of these possible infractions and the penalty. The penalty is community service. So if I get caught, remember we're talking about college age men here and this is typical, if I get caught on campus with an open container, we go to the document and it says, I, I don't know exactly what it says, but it'll say eight or ten hours of community service. That means they do the laundry, they, they clean the floor, they pick up trash, they do whatever they have. Ever, ever have to do. So the person who created the problem is, is punished or has consequences, not at the expense of what happens with the team. All right, so, so we, we do that all the time. And the council is really, really good. It's a, it's a great learning experience for the guys on the council. And again, college age guys. A few years ago, we had a young man who was arrested in his dormitory room because he had uh, a, a lot of pot. And, and smoking paraphernalia and so on. So he went to court and all that stuff. He, he, he was found guilty. So now what do you do? That wasn't on our list. Okay, so this was a new, this was a, this was a new, it's on the list now, by the way. But, but th this, this was a new problem, all right? We went to the council, and here's what the council came up with. Um, suspended for eight games, but had to go to practice every single day. The council felt that this young man needed us more than we needed him. But, so they were adamant about that. And of course, he had to do the laundry and all those things. In addition, he had to go to a, a drug counselor every Wednesday for the rest of the semester and supply me with a note from the counselor that he attended. Additionally, he had to go to every elementary school in Delaware, Ohio, and give a lecture about smoking pot and drugs and so on. Now, isn't that brilliant? Think about that. That's brilliant. And it's far more than I would have done. Seriously. But a learning experience for the young man who screwed up and a learning experience for the guys on, on the council. There's no caste system. Every class is represented, as I said. Everybody on the team has a voice. I think that's very important. I'll come back to that. Um, and of course, what if the team outvotes what I think? And as I tell people, I count the votes, so it really doesn't make any difference what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the first thing we do on the first day of preseason as a team is to define our values. And so each senior on the team has a group of underclassmen, and I have a values list of about 400 values. The seniors will take their group, go out someplace in the facility, talk to their guys, and they have to come back in 30 minutes with 20 values. And of course, we put them on the board, then we send them out again, we collate it, send them out again, they have to come back with 10 values. All right? And then, from, the, from that list, we define what our values are for that year. And certainly, 
you know, certainly there's a carryover. I mean, you know, honesty, the things that we want to happen every year. But it's really good that, that, that it's really good because the guys take this very seriously. Uh, especially the older guys, the freshmen have no clue what we're doing, none. And you know, they just sit there and shake their head. But they take this very, very seriously. And, and it's their values, not mine, not mine. So if we're in October now and there's a problem, we can go back to the values and we can say, hey, this was your value. What, what's, what's going on here? Um, I, if, are your values defined who set them? I'm adamant about the, about the players setting them. All right. Don't be afraid to talk about the values that are important to your group. How do your values impact what happens every single day? And I think you'll see here, I hope you'll see here in a minute, uh, Olu Saka, a few values, honesty, passion, uh, ambition, commitment, responsibility, leadership, Smiles, always smiles. Really, really important. All right, that, that the guys are having fun and we're smiling. Soccer is a game, and a game means fun. If it stops being fun, if it stops being fun, it becomes work, and they're going to work the rest of their lives. So let's have fun, and they do their best work. Is that me? Okay. They they do their best work when they're having fun. Um. Second thing we do after we get the values taken care of is, is goal setting. It's exactly the same system. The guys, the seniors will take their group and they will go out and they will start talking about goals. We have what we call competitive goals, which of course are on the field goals, and we have of course off, off the field goals. And we go through the same process. The guys come back, we collate the goals, here's what we have, here's what's going on, and then from that we, we get it down to six or eight attainable Goals. All right, so then after that, we make this big chart. We put on a laminate it, and all the guys have to sign it, even the coaching staff. And we hang it up in the locker room. We have a, in our locker room, we have a team room, and then you have to walk through this door to the lockers. We hang it right there. Do they read it every day? Of course they don't. But subliminally, it's there and they know what's going on. And again, our guys set the goals, not me. I have my goals for the team, but, I, but they set theirs, all right? And you know, so we have the off-field goals, we have win, the off-field goals, I think that no arrests, I think that's a good one. I think that's a goal that we could all have, probably. I'm not sure about that. College-age men, please understand that. I'm a little more liberal than most of the coaches at Ohio Wesleyan, 60s and 70s and all that stuff. I think college, is a place where young men screw up. I mean, I just think that happens. Now, if they keep doing the same thing over and over and over, then that becomes a problem. But both of my sons went to Ohio Wesleyan, both were all Americas, one in soccer, one in golf. Both were very good students, but both did really, really stupid things at some point. So, I mean, that's, I think that's what happens. And right now, they're gainfully employed, so that's the, the best part of it, all right? So anyway, these are set by the team. And, and of course, I think it's ironic, let me see, these are the goals that we set in 2012. Um, is there anything up there about the national championship? Every year, we used, the boys used to set the goal about winning the national championship. Now, as you heard, in my 38 years, we've been to the tournament 35 times, which is pretty good. And we've only, but we've only won the thing two times, which is pretty bad. If I were a Major League Baseball player, two, two for 35 just doesn't get it done, right? So what I found out over a period of time, what I think is we were, we were putting undue pressure on the guys. We always had a good team, and they felt as we got closer and closer to the tournament time, they felt heavy, heavy, heavy. Six times we've been undefeated going into the tournament, and six those years we did not win the national championship. So, so the guys figured this out, and two or three years ago they, they dropped um, the national championship thing. All right, what are, the, what are good goals? You all know this, specific, measurable, realistic, time stamp, a freshman comes in and says to me, I want to be an all American We also do personal goal setting with every, every single player three times a year, which is very, very time consuming. When I talk to coaching groups about this, the first question is, Jay, isn't that time consuming? And first I'm thinking, well, what else do you have to do? This is your job. But secondly, I'm thinking, um, how much do you like to win? How much do you like to be successful? So you have to put in time for that to happen. So we do personal goal setting three times, 
three times a year as well. So, so if a freshman comes in and says, I want to be an All-American, that's not a bad goal, but not for a freshman. How about you want to make the team? Let's go one, let's go one step at a time here. Because as you know, goal setting is, is, is a motivation. If the goals are too difficult, then it becomes frustrating for the, for the players and demotivating. If the goals are too easy, they're on them right away, and then, right, then what? What's next? So we have to, setting the goals is a little bit of an art. Very, very quickly, 1976, I finished my, my coursework at Ohio State. I had, I had to take two units to get out of there with a PhD. I took a course in the business school. The course was called um, Management by Objectives, MBO, which now all of you know about. But in 76, it was a new and developing uh, system for managers. It was a one-on-one -on -one system, as you know, for managers to try to motivate the employees or have the employees motivate themselves, all right? And I sat there for the entire semester and I said, you know, I can, I can tweak this a little bit and make this and use this as a coach in sports. And so since the day I've been on the Ohio Wesleyan campus, I've used this, I call it motivation by objectives, not management, but I've used it for both the soccer, the soccer team and the lacrosse team for the, for the first eight years. And if we've had any success, um, I, I really give a lot of credit to this, not me, a lot of credit to this. I have guys who call me, email me, text me, which is really hard because I can't text them back, so I, I, don't, I don't want them to do that, but um, who tell me that they still use goal setting and what they do and, and how thankful they were that they, they learned how to do this. So we do fall team goals and then we have player goals. Before every single game, we have game goals. I give the sheet out in the training session before tomorrow's game and the idea is there are four columns. The idea is for each player to, to set goals for themselves for tomorrow night, tomorrow night. Then they set up the second column is potential obstacles. The third column is the most important, what's my plan? And then the fourth column is my evaluation of what they did. So I'm a defensive midfielder, so one of my goals is to make sure that the attacking midfielder on the other team doesn't score a goal. The potential obstacle, he's a three-time All-America and he's leading, the, he's leading the country in goal scoring. All right? So what's my plan? What's my plan? So I'm not going to let him get the ball. I mean, boom. So the player walks onto the field with a plan. Now, winning is not a goal. It's unacceptable. These are process goals. These are process. I never want an Ohio Wesleyan player walking on the field thinking, we have to win this game tonight. If we don't win this game tonight, uh, we're not going to go to the tournament because if we think that, we're not going to win the game and we're not going to go to the tournament. It's just that simple. So, so there, there, are, there are game goals. And these guys, again, they take them seriously. And of course, uh, you know, I'm a little bit older now and sometimes I forget to print out the game goals in practice, but the guys do it on their own. They'll take a piece of notebook paper and, and they will do it. So maybe it Half time I come in and I go, you know, Joe, uh, you told me number six wasn't going to have a shot. Well, he's had five. What, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do? Well, maybe Joe change, isn't good enough to play that kid, so maybe we change. Maybe we change tactics and put another kid in that area or, or whatever it is. Again, input by the guys. Uh, our goal setting step number one is the guys have a self-evaluation. I think you all know at some level that the most difficult thing, one of the most difficult things in life is to look in the mirror and honestly evaluate yourself because we all think we're better than we really are. It's really, really hard. But until you can do that honestly and realistically, you're not going to get better in what you do. It's that simple. I think it was Earl Weaver, coach of the manager of the Baltimore Orioles, who wrote a book called It's What You Learn After You Know It All That Counts. And, right? and, that, and that, says, that says everything. So it's a self-evaluation. We have an instrument for the players. The first page is the same. It's a fitness, mental uh, technique. And the back page is position specific. And we talk about attacking and defending in each position. So they evaluate themselves. I evaluate them. They come in one-on-one -on -one and we go over the eva evaluation. All right. So um, three things happen when we do that. The first is that instrument that I mentioned is a job description for them as a player. I can't be any more specific about my expectations for them as a, a defender than that instrument. Can't be more spe specific. Secondly, 
They know exactly where they stand in my eyes. Now, they can disagree with me. That's fine. It doesn't bother me. We can, we can have some banter about this, that, or the other thing. Because some of the questions, in fact, only they know the answers to, you know, coachability and some other things. And then finally, from that, from that, they set goals. So they take their strengths and weaknesses we've identified, they go away, they set four or five goals, they come back, I check them, I usually send them away again because the goals aren't very good the first couple times that they do it, and then we have goal setting. Now, this is important for you to understand. Intrinsic motivation is what we're all about. So this is intrinsic motivation. If this young man wants to become an All-America, become All-Conference, make the team, if he really wants to do it, he will follow the plan and he will get better. If he doesn't want to do it, or if he's going through the motions, or he's trying to placate me and, and be happy, then he's not going to uh, reach his goals. I have never, in 38 years, gone into the weight room to watch my players work out in the weight room. First of all, I have other things to do. I, Secondly, if they're in there without me, that's intrinsic motivation. They are doing whatever they're doing for themselves to get better to make the team. As soon as I walk in that door, I become the motivation, and I don't want to become the motivation. They have to have the motivation. They have to mo have the motivation to change the way they play and do it honestly. I've never watched an Ohio Wesleyan soccer player do his, do his indoor running in the winter. Never, never. I just don't care. But I watch very carefully the first practice session in the spring. And it takes me about 10 minutes to figure out if these guys followed their plan and really did what they wanted to do. So when that young man comes to me, as I mentioned a moment ago, his junior year and says, Jay, why aren't I playing? I'll say, you tell me. Because he knows why he's not playing. Deep down inside, he knows. I might not be able to, you know. So we do in, the, um, we do, uh, in pre season for the season. In January, we set goals for the winter, and those are usually fitness goals because we can't play much, obviously, in the winter. And then we set goals again the week of April, uh, the first week in April for the spring season. And again, those are usually improvement, I call them improvement goals, you know, whatever, improve my technique, whatever, whatever it is. Now, if, we, if things are going badly, I'll do this a fourth time going into the summer. And those, again, are usually fitness-related goals. Um, but usually, it's three times a year. Humility, really, really important for, 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 my, for me and my team. Really, really important. Let's see what the next one is here. All right, I got this. I, I got this years and years ago. I've been fortunate enough to, to travel a lot. I lived in Germany for slightly over five years. I played professional basketball because I'm an awful soccer player, one of the worst in history. Um, but that's where I, I, I lived in Munich, and then I lived in Dusseldorf. That's where I really got into to soccer, because it was clearly a, a soccer environment. I played soccer in high school and, uh, and college, but I was really, really bad. In fact, I only remember starting twice in my college career. I think there was an epidemic on the team. Uh, the, the coach looked down the bench. I was like the only one, literally the only one, only one left. So that's how it is. But that's okay. But what I know is this, and I agree with the Dutch. Here's what the Dutch say. The Dutch say, you don't change as a person when you walk onto the field. And many coaches think that. They th you're the same person. If you take shortcuts, off the field, you're going to take shortcuts on the field. That's how it is. You don't change. You know, uh, Adolf Rupp and some of these others early in the early history of the United States collegiate sports always talked about participating in, in football or basketball, build character. No, it doesn't. It does not. You come with character. And, and playing in sports reveals what your character is. So this is what we feel. You don't change when you walk on the field. It doesn't happen. If you go to every class and you do your homework, then you are going to do the same thing on the field. That's how it is. If you skip class, if your grades are awful, and so on, it's, it's going to be reflected on the field. And that's, that's an impact uh, to, to, to this program. All right, very, very, very important. Um, OK, um, it, this is a we program. We share the duties. We do everything. I don't allow buildings and grounds to come up to our field at all. 
The only thing Gillies and Grounds will do for us is cut the grass and put the lines on, because I'm not capable of either. All right? But after games, we pick up the trash in the stands, we clean the locker rooms, we clean the concession stand, we clean the restrooms. This is our home. This is our home. And I want to make, I want to make the connection between the guys and the facility, I want to make that really strong. It's not a place they come up to and go through the motions, right, and go home. That isn't it. It's their home. Um, it's really, to me, this is really, really important. Not only that, we help other other teams on campus. The women's softball field, uh, field as you know, is a, it's not like men's baseball. It's all dirt. And of course, after every winter, there are all kinds of weeds and so on. So every single year for the last six, seven, eight years, we go down and we take care of the weeds for the women's softball team. We go to Germany every three years. We go to this uh, little town in Germany called Baumhole, about an hour and a half southwest of Frankfurt. There's a U.S. military base there. In fact, it used to be the largest military, U.S. military base um, outside of the United States in the world. At one point, there were 28,000 uh, soldiers there. It's, it's much, much smaller now. But the first thing we do when we get there on the first day is we give a soccer clinic to the American kids who are on that base. And the guys spend, we spend three, four, five hours with the kids, with the kids on the base. And we bring t-shirts for them and Ohio Wesleyan stickers and all those things. Giving back, giving back, giving back. And the good news is then those kids will follow us around Germany with their families and they'll be our, they'll be our fans as we, go, as we go through that process. And it's a really, 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 really good experience. Another thing we do, to me, it's not a soccer trip, it's a cultural trip. Our guys live with German families when they're in Baumholder. We usually go Baumholder, then down to Munich, then back to Baumholder, and up to Cologne, and Gelsenkirchen, and so on. Um, so they, but they live with, and we go over there, and they're so nervous about living with families, they would much rather live in a hotel, or what, or what have you. But you know what the best part of the trip is at the end? The families the families. Now Delaware and Baumholder are sister cities. We're sending high school kids back and forth, teachers back and forth. So this relationship that started with soccer has grown uh, in, into, the, into politics, which I'm not very comfortable with, but that's all right. Um, take pride in our home. No housekeepers, trash on the ground. You pick it up. Uh, the coaches, players, everybody helps with the laundry. I've done the laundry is more, more than any other player ever. That's how it is. I sweep the floor. I help pick up the stands. I don't stand there and say, pick up the stands. I was a Boy Scout. I know I don't look like it, but I was. Um, and an eagle and all that stuff. The only thing I remember about my time in Boy Scouts was the chapter in the, in the Boy Scout handbook on leadership. It's the only thing I remember. And here, here's the picture. There were two pictures at the beginning of the chapter. There's a picture with obviously the leader of the, of the group standing here with four or five guys here. The first picture said, go get some wood. The second picture said, let's go get some wood. I have never, ever forgotten that, ever. Let us, it's a contraction, let us go get some wood. Far more powerful, far more powerful. Let's do the laundry. Let's pick up the stands. Let's move the gold. Let us do it. I don't have this relationship. I'm here and here are the players. Don't do that. We're here. We're, we're, in, we're, in this, we're in this together. I'm always thinking about helping Special Olympic soccer clinics, women's softball field I've already mentioned. You, this is us in San Antonio. What a bunch of good looking guys, huh? All right. I, I put that in here though because it's their team. It's their team. I already have tenure at Ohio Wesleyan. They can't fire me. I'm not going anywhere, right? But they're here for four years. Only four years. And all of you know, either your, your own experience or a child's, how fast those four years go. It's incredible. I mean, I can't explain how fast my first 38 have gone. Now, I say first 38, suggesting there'll be a second 38. I don't think so, but I just want people to pay attention to what I'm saying, all right? Um, it's the players' team and program. The players are responsible for upholding the standards and the expectations of the group. And the players are responsible. And we do a whole bunch of things to hopefully help our guys in a number of areas. For example, in preseason, each senior uh, is assigned a, um, a topic 
that he has to present to the underclassmen, especially the freshmen. For example, how to take a multiple choice test, how to do, write small essays, how to find stuff in the library or whatever. So what we're trying to do is help our seniors become leaders and speakers and have our underclassmen get better academically. So we do all these little things all the time that have absolutely nothing to do, to do with soccer. But the seniors pass on the culture and the tradition of the program to the freshmen. It's a cyclical, ongoing thing. I have nothing to do with it. It's all about the players. And that's why seniors uh, are very important in college sports. Really, really important. I mean, ask Thad Mata, right? He can't get anybody to senior year. And, and you're not gonna win anything without a good group of seniors who are leaders, who pull the freshmen along, and so on. We have a mentor program. Each freshman coming in will be assigned an upperclassman, a junior or a senior, and we have, we have standards to be a mentor. You have to be over 3-0 to be a mentor because we want your mentee, if that's a word, we want him to be over 3-0. Right. We, have a, we have a document that the mentor has to meet with his, his, uh, his freshman uh, four times in the first semester. Once in preseason, once after two weeks, one, once right before mid, midterms, very, very important meeting, and then one at the end. There's an agenda for each one of these meetings, and the mentor uh, will, will respond to me about how the kid's doing. But the mentors take this beyond that. They will talk to the, they will talk to the professors of, of, each, of the, each of the guys. They might walk in and go, Jay, uh, you know, Joe's not going to Dr. Pinkley's class. That's a problem. That's a problem that we're going to have to deal with. So we get the counsel, and we take, take care of business. If you're over a 275, you don't have to, uh, you won't have a mentor anymore. And that's our goal and for freshman 275. All of you haven't been to college know that in every college, university, there's a group of freshman faculty whose job it is to make your life miserable and to show you that you're in the big leagues now. So 275 is, is a pretty good standard. Most of our guys, 26 of 30, Four guys today are over 3-0 on the team, so, so that's, that's not bad. Um, um, but if you, even as a sophomore, junior, or senior, if you're below 275, you have a mentor. And, that, and that's embarrassing. They don't, they, don't want, they don't want that. They don't want a teammate telling them they've got to go to class and all these things. We have study tables. That was in place before I came to Ohio Wesleyan. I haven't been to one of them. They run by the seniors. Sunday night through Thursday night, two hours a night. I get the list on Friday. If you and they've got to go three of the four because other things happen in college. I understand that. So if I get the list Friday and you, you're not on there three times, then you don't play on the weekend. Very, very simple. Happens once or twice a year. Not, not a lot, but, but, that, but that's how it is. These programs are not meant to be invasive. They're meant to be supportive. All right, we're not trying to you know, be minutia guys all over these kids. We're trying to help them get through. They don't know how much help they need at the beginning. Freshman academic indoctrination, I already talked about that. Our upperclassmen are talking about how to take a test, how to do this, how to do that. Uh, and empowerment, very important part of, of my philosophy and my program. I empower everybody around me. Uh, my assistant coaches, my players, my philosophy is that I am I am preparing them to leave from day one. Preparing them to leave from day one. There are over 30 of my former players and assistant coaches who are coaching in college today because I empower them. I'm not the type of coach that's going to do all the work and have the assistant coaches watch. I don't do that. Okay, today, Joe, I want you to do boom. And so I'll step back and I'll watch Joe do it. All right? At the end of training, I'll never correct him, ever ever correct them in front of the players. But at the end of training, Joe, not bad. You could have tried this. You could have done this. How about this? Next time, hopefully, Joe, Joe's, Joe's a little better. My players are empowered. Um, I want and seek their input on all matters on the field. All matters. Um, it's my responsibility to pre prepare you to leave. And how do you empower your people is, is, is my, qu my question. Give players, coaches, trainers a say in the decision-making process. Even our trainer, even our equipment per persons, even our managers have a say 
and I, and I take what they say seriously. Some of the best suggest, suggestions that I've received over the years have come from people who are a little bit removed from the program. How about this? How about that? Hey, that's a great idea. I never thought about it. My only purpose is to help this organization get better. And I usually say this at the beginning, and I apologize, I forgot. To me, there's a huge difference between a college athletic team and a college athletic program. A team meets every day for two hours and practices and plays a game on the weekends. A program is the other 22 hours. And that's the studying, taking care of yourself nutritionally, and so on and so forth. That's what a program is. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, trying to have my players create an emotional attachment to the program. It's something more than that, that, that them showing up at, at, nine, at 4 o'clock every day and playing soccer. It's more than that. In fact, we open the facility at 2 every day, and guys are up there already. And I have to kick them out so I can go home. We have a you know, satellite dish, big screen TV. They watch soccer from all over the, all over the world. We have a very nice room. We call it our team room, but it's got couches and chairs and things. So, so it's, I, I want them looking forward to practice all day long. And when they leave, I want to smile on their face. And that takes a little work on, on our part. And I'll show you how we do that, I hope, in a minute. I've got to get moving here. All right. um, I'm looking for staff people who are going to challenge me. I'm not interested in yes men at all. Um, coaches are control freaks. All coaches are control freaks. And I guess, you know, at some point I can understand that because many coaches, their livelihood is dependent upon what 18 and 19-year-old uh, young men and women do, so I understand that to, to a certain degree, um, but that to me is counter, counterproductive. I say this at clinics and, and all the time. To really gain power, do you know what you have to do? You have to give up power. Then you really, really gain power. And when I say that, most of the coaches I'm talking to are looking at me like I have two heads. What is he talking about? The fact of the matter is now, my guys don't want to let me down because the program is theirs. Um, it's probably because nobody wants to let their grandfather down. That's my guess, you know, but uh, a few years ago it was maybe my, the older brother, who knows what it was, but, but they don't want to let me down because it's not my program, it's our program. And therefore, the, the, the power you gain by giving up power is, to me, is really, really important. Change. Four or five years ago, now look, we, we've, we win 85% of our games, we, you heard all that stuff. Um, but four or five years ago, my assistant coach at the time and I totally changed everything in the program. Everything. We wanted to get better. And we didn't want anybody catching us. Most people change when they have to. Good programs, good organizations, good firms change all the time. Ch change all the time to get better. I was just spent the last week in Munich, Germany with my oldest son who's a soccer coach as well. We went to soccer games, we went to practices. I want to get better. I want to get better. He wants to get better. So I've got some changes already that I'm going to make in the program as a result of, of, of last week. These times are changing all the time. You know that. You must be open to change, and you must, in my opinion, be proactive and not reactive. So all of a sudden, Denison starts beating us every year in, in soccer. Well, that's, it's too late then. It's too late to change. I mean, we will, we'll try to, try to change, but now we're chasing things instead of staying out, staying out in front. So we evaluate our program. We have an exit interview with every single senior. What went right, what went wrong, what can we do better, what suggestions you have for the program. We want to continue improving and continue getting, getting better. That's 38 years now, I'll have to change that. We've been fortunate to, to I've changed. I've changed. My coaching's changed. Um, my, my training sessions have changed. The way I deal with players has changed. Because as you all know, the players are changing. They're, they're different now than they were 25 years ago, right? Trust me, they're different. So if I'm still doing what I did 25 years ago, we're no good. We're 500. That, that's how it is. And so you've got to read the kids, you've got to assess what's, what's going on, and, you, and you've got to be lucky enough to make the right decisions. Um, We've incorporated global ideas. I go to Europe at least once every single year to do what I just did last week uh, to get better. 
um, I'm, I'm, I have an affinity for Germany, I speak the language, I live there and so on and so forth and I think they just won the World Cup and I think that's pretty good, pretty good soccer. I think they figured it out. I think they know what they have to do to be, to be successful. And when I watch their youth teams play last week and I watch our youth te teams play, it's, it's sad, really. It's really sad. I, I, facing adversity. All right, Debbie, I've got to talk real fast here. Facing adversity. So we fly into San Antonio for the final four. We get, we get some four vans at the airport, and we're driving uh, back to our, into our hotel. We stop at a Panera for lunch. While we're in Panera, two of our vans were rifled, and we lost everything in those two vans, everything. We lost over 15 computers. Guys lost all of their clothes. We lost uniforms. Those two vans, everything. And we haven't been in San Antonio for an hour yet, for an hour. Now, it's the week before finals, and most of our guys are pretty serious students. So they lost their laptops with their presentations and their PowerPoints and all this, all of it gone, all of it gone. So what do you do? The decisions that we had to make in the next hour, in the next 10 minutes, would decide the outcome of the weekend. That's how it is, that's how it is. My first. My first suggestion to the team was, look, guys, it's happened. Let's embrace it, not like it. You'll never get this weekend back. In a couple of weeks, you'll have a new computer. No problem, all right? So let me see if we can do this. Um, all right, let's see where we are. So every year, we have books, and you'll see a list in a second, that the, guy, that the seniors read and, and report to the team. It just so happened that that year, we, one of the books was bounced by Keith McFarlane. You've, you've all seen this genre. It's about 100 pages long. It was about a, a guy uh, who's a, a, a businessman whose business is going under, and he, every night he goes to the gym and, 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 and lifts his frustrations away, and there he meets a uh, special forces uh, Army man, or whatever they, whatever they call it. And this guy, the army guy, starts talking to him about adversity and what you have to do to change adversity. Do you get it? Bounce, down, bounce. What are you going to do to bounce up? Number one, embrace the bounce. So I told the guys, look, it's happened. There's nothing we can do about it. All right? So we've got to put it, if you can, compartmentalize it, put it aside, and go forward. Number two, we had to manage the anxiety. I called, this is the advantage of a school like here in uh, Ohio Wesleyan, I called the president from San Antonio. I told him what happened. Within an hour, every faculty person had a list of guys on the team whose stuff was gone and so on. Two faculty members jumped on a plane and came down to San Antonio to help, to help the guys. Apparently there was a huge uh, uh, accounting final or something coming up and uh, like on the Tuesday right after the championship game. So two economics professors were in San Antonio, uh, in San Antonio the next, the next uh, day. My original goal was to go back to the hotel and to uh, you know, check in and get organized and all that stuff. I changed right away. I called my friend who was the coach at Trinity University in Texas and I made plans to go right to his institution and have practice. I wanted to change the mindset. Ironically, we had maybe the best practice we've ever had uh, on that year. In, in San Antonio, but it took the load. It took the load immediately off the guys. Right? And number three then was manage the mental factors. So we changed everything. Instead of going to some, uh, the AD didn't really appreciate this, but I, I upgraded the trip. I mean, we went to better Italian restaurants, we went to nicer places, because I wanted these guys to, to get something positive out of this. Now when I turned in the, the receipts, you know, that's how it is. <laughs> um, but you see, I was AD for 20 years at Ohio Wesleyan, and uh, so I kind of, I was, I was never in budget once. To me, budget is defined by best guess. That's how it is, and uh, that's, that's what I did, all right? Uh, manage the money didn't apply to us really too much in this situation, although we did go into uh, stores and had to buy even underwear. For guys. guys lost everything lost everything. I called the SID who was coming down tomorrow. He went in to our locker room to get extra uniforms. My buddy at Trinity gave our guy shoes. So we're going into the national championship game with, with somebody else's shoes. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. But what happened then, and then finally, manage the mission. All right, you'll never get this weekend back. 
manage the, mi the mission. So by the end of the first day, we were making jokes about what happened. And some of the guys were saying that they thought they saw a Montclair State van come in and take stuff and, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So the pressure was immediately off. It was immediately off. And when the guys got back to campus, the professors bent over backwards to, to help them out, which, was, which is an advantage of a school like Ohio Wesleyan, Audubon, and, and so on. Bounce. Books. Here are some of the books that we've looked over the last few. Renus Mickles is a Dutchman who, who wrote a book about team building. The Talent Code, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Seven Habits of Highly Effective. Leading at the Edge, Shackleford, going to uh, the Antarctica. Great, great book about adversity and hardship. The Winner Within by Pat Riley on Becoming a Leader by Bennis. Uh, and uh, Success is a Choice by Patino. Uh, leading with the Heart, Coach K. Any Maxwell book our guys will present. There's a book called Confidence. I think this is the biggest problem we have for college athletes. Do you agree with that? Uh, co confidence is so difficult for men and women. Women, women worse. It's worse for women. Um, I don't know why, but here's the best we get out of our guys. And confidence changes daily, weekly. It changes in a game, confidence. You know, your first shot's on goal, great. First one goes over the top. You're done. So we've got to work on that. Uh, thinking fast and slow. The team captains, we have a leadership manual written by Jeff Jansen, who's a, who's a, uh, a sports psych guy down in North Carolina that, our, that all of our captains get. It's a really, really good book about being a captain, what you have to do to be a captain. There they are. All right. So our seniors will read one of these and make a presentation at some time in the season. It's usually on a rainy day. What I found out <coughs> over the years is if the weather's awful and it's rainy and it's cold, practicing outside is a waste of time. It's an absolute waste. So what we do is we work on the mind when it's like that. And so maybe, you know, so the, uh, in preseason, all the seniors get a book, and, the, and I tell them to be ready with a PowerPoint presentation. Is there something I said? Okay, and then rainy day, we present to the team. Um, <coughs> um, this, this is cutting into my time, Debbie. I want you to know that. All right. Okay. Um, there were four U.S. soccer. I got six minutes. All right. Um, uh, there are four pillars in soccer. We have five at Ohio Wesleyan. The technique, the tactic, the mental, the physical, and we've added a third, and that's the emotional. The mental to me is the pre preparing to play. The emotional to me is how you deal with what happens on the field, right? So you, you, your opponent kicks you. How are you going to deal with that? Uh, oftentimes, that will depend. That will help uh, the outcome. Right? We're at University of Chicago one year in the quarterfinals NCAA tournament. Obviously, it's windy as hell in November. So I decided to do something I never do, but I knew the wind wouldn't change. I decided that we would defend the wind in the first half and then take it in the second half. If I were in Ohio, I'd take it the first half because at night the wind dies here. So we played a great first half. And with 37 seconds left, it was 0-0. With 37 seconds left, the referee called a foul on one of our backs. And so they had a, Chicago had a shot um, from 35 yards or so. They put it up on the jet stream. Our goalkeeper caught it. Joe Anstein from Westerville right here caught it, stepped back. The referee who was out there called it a goal. Video shows later it wasn't even close to a goal. NCAA tournament, that perfect half, all of a sudden we're down 0-1. And scoring the first goal in the NCAA tournament, I cannot even explain how critical that is. Right before halftime, the worst time it could happen. So I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say to these guys? And I'm listening as they're coming in. And they weren't mad about the foul. They, they were a little upset about the referee. Uh, they weren't mad about the, the goalkeeper, no problem. All they were doing is talking about what they had to do in the second half to be successful. I didn't say one word at halftime. I took out a midfielder, put in a forward, 
After four minutes, it was three to one. At the end, it was six to one. But you see, that had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with them. We talk about it all the time. I make up stuff in training. I'll pull out a yellow card in training. I'll pull out a red card in training. I'll call, make a bad foul call in training. So they get used to understand that these, that these things happen. What are the necessary skills in your organization? Are they defined? Do you know what they are? Do you know what your employees are? The pillars of soccer, business, mental toughness, emotional toughness, how you deal with what happens. Uh, that's, I'm running out of time. I can't tell that story. So here's our, our mental training stuff. We do goal setting, pre-game and pre-practice routines. Absolutely critical to success. Our practice before every game is exactly the same. Exactly. Every single, we start the mental process the day before the game. And it's in a very defined order. Self-affirmation, communication, stress, arousal control, self-confidence, team confidence, adversity, psychological profiles we do every year. We have a, a, a relationship with a group from Chicago called Exact Sports that help, help us with this stuff. The training session, I've already told you. It's about the details. Here's one of my training things here. It's very, very specific. And guys play with guys they're going to play with on the field instead of playing some random guy in, the, in, the, in training. They play with the person who's going to be next to them on the field. Everything has a time limit. Everything has a time limit. Think about this. If I say to the team, okay, we're going to play 3v3. Ready? Tweet, go. So, okay. Now, we're going to play 3v3 for three minutes. Ready? Go. You see the difference? For that three minutes, I'm gonna, the, the intensity goes up immediately. If you don't have a time limit, then the guys just kind of go through the motions. They're, they're not sure how long it's going to last. They don't know what's going on. Everything we do is timed. Everything. So we'll go three minutes, one minute rest, three minutes, one minute rest, and so on. And during the rest, we're working on the, on the mental side. We talk about deliberate practice a lot at Ohio Wesleyan. Coming, our players in this country are... Um, are reactive. They show up to practice, they stand around, they wait for the coach to, to say something, okay guys, do this. That's not, that's not how you get better. That's not how you get better. Whether it's a soccer field or a business or, or, or whatever. And, and so we talk about that all the time. They have to bring their own goals to practice. I, it's not unusual for me to walk around and go, hey, Joe, what's your goal today? Well, blah, blah, blah. And I know some of them are BSing me. I know that. But, but, but at least after a while, they're going to start think, they're gonna start thinking about it. All right? Catch them being good. That's what I tell my coaches. Catch them being good, especially in our camps. At start this summer, I have some brochures over here for your kids if you're interested. I'm just kidding. Um, you, can, you can find something good in every single player every single day. Now, some of you have to look a little harder. Right? But you can find, I tell my guys in camp, I want you to find something good with every player in your group. Even little Joe Bag of Donuts over there, who's never played soccer, will never play soccer again, but I want him to come back in the next session with a smile. I want him to come back tomorrow with a smile. Catch them, and it's the same. So the guys are 18 or 10, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. Catch them doing something good. Uh, winning coach style. Presence, courage, stick to your philosophy, leadership, yes is yes, no is no, maybe is an awful word. Communication, reflection, I'm a freak, a notebook freak, I've got notebooks. I have every single practice session that we've ever had in the last 38 years. So if any of you want to know what we did on October 10th in 1986, just shoot me an email and I can tell you, I can tell you. But every practice and every game, I take time to reflect what was good, what was bad. I'll ask my players as we're walking in, hey, Joe, how was that, you know, that blank, blankety blank activity? Was that good? Did, did it do what we wanted to do? I want the input. He goes, Jay, it was awful. It's done. We don't do it again. That's how it is. We can, we can find something else. Relationships, very, very important. You talk to Krzyzewski. And he'll tell you that relationships are the most important thing for coaches, and I agree with that. He will tell you that in terms of basketball knowledge, he thinks that he's about halfway through the ACC, that these other coaches know more than he does. And trust me, in my conference, other coaches know more than I do. Trust me on that. But it's the relationships. It's the relationships that help you create a winning and positive environment. Balance, coaching we're talking about. Switch it off. Calmness, I don't yell at the refs. 
I don't yell at my players. When we score a goal, I don't jump, jump up and down like an idiot. When they score a goal, I don't scream at anybody. Calm, calm. Because I want to do the same thing all the time. Because after they score a goal, my team will look over and I'll be just standing there. Okay, guys, let's, let's go kick off. Let's move on, right? When we score a goal, that, no problem. I'm not going to jump up and down. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we practice all week to do. Why jump up and down about it, all right? But calmness is very, very important. Optimism, and uh, th th there they are in a nutshell. Process first outcome. I'm, 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 I'm out of time. So um, if you have to leave, I apologize. I've just got a couple of minutes left. But, but maybe, you've, maybe you've surmised that I'm a process guy and not an outcome guy. I mean, when, when I was asked how many, how many games uh, uh, we won, I don't know, to be honest. But it is more than 640. I will say that, OK? <laughs> 640 was two or three years ago, so it's in the 50s or 60s now. But, but see, I don't care. I don't care, truly. I'm embarrassed about all those things. When I win Coach of the Year and stuff, I'm embarrassed. I mean, because I had so, so little to do with it, really. All right, it's, it's the guy, the process, all right? Here's what's in, effort is the key. You all know that now. There's a big, talent means nothing. It means nothing. I'm, that's all right, doesn't matter. All right, effort, okay? <laughs> Write this down if you're interested. There's a woman from Stanford, her name is Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, who, who has done a lot of research on the current young generation. And what she says is, our kids don't work hard enough. They do not work hard enough. And especially kids with a great deal of talent um, who have gotten through youth and high school solely on their talent, then they come to college and all of a sudden they, they, they don't play, they can't play because they've never lost and they've never had a game where they didn't score a goal. So they think it's easy, it's not easy. Tyler Wall is one of those guys. Very frustrating to me. Um, Talent, unbelievable talent, but when things went bad, he didn't know what to do on the field. He, he wanted to hide. He didn't know what to do. So we have to Effort is what we talk about all the time. I never say to the guys, good pass, good pass. I never say too many positive things. I mean, too much positive things. But I always talk about, hey, great defense, great run, great this. All right? To gain power, you must give up power. I've already told you that. I learned that from Krzyzewski, John Wooden, blah, blah. Uh, uh, this is the humility part again. This is the day after we lost all of our stuff in San Antonio. We had to give a clinic in San Antonio for uh, special needs kids. And uh, all eight teams at the tournament, four men, four women, had to give a clinic. The photographer from San Antonio paper came to me uh, during our clinic and he said, you guys are the only ones who really care about this. So we taught these kids how to play soccer and we had a great time. There's some great clips of it and I'll tell you what, honestly, I was more proud of the team that day than when we won the national championship. I mean, they're wearing other people's gear and shoes that are too big and, you know, a, a collection of, of, of gear and, and so on and so forth. Those kids had a great time. The, 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 the person who ran the program came over and thanked me. And every other, of the other seven groups were doing nothing. Humility. Give something back. Give something back. That might be it. Is that it? The end. All right? <laughs> Or, or else this is broken. I don't know. If you have to leave, I would please do uh, quick questions. Yeah. Anybody have a question? Yes. Um, to, to get to your level, to play at your level, it's a lot of hard work. Correct. Um, and as a young, as a young coach, he hears you talk about fun. How do you balance that? How do you sell that? How do you find fun and, and balance it with the amount of hard work? That Part of fun is doing the best you can. You, you, you gain a satisfaction. Don't, don't we all? When you do something as well as you possibly can, there's a self-satisfaction that you feel that's fun. That's fun. And, and, and secondly, for us, everything we do in practice is, um, is a challenge. So it's all, and we keep score in practice. The reds against the grays. The score at the end of practice is a winning team and a losing team. The winning team gets their picture taken and we hang it up in the locker room. The losing team picks up the gear or does the wash or does something like that, and then we do it again tomorrow. So hard work, satisfaction, challenging, 
each other. They're smiling because you you know young men and women. They, they like be beating their buddies more than they like beating Den Dennis in a canyon. I mean, they really really like that. For 24 hours, they get to you know, and then tomorrow we do it again. So it, it's it's difficult, and you know we tell jokes, we have fun, but we work hard. We work really hard. Does that make sense? Yes. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So I get, I get the idea. You work really, really hard preparing, practice, and all that. What What do you do? I, I'm guessing that maybe all you do is observe during a game. Can you tell me more? That's what it. Goes on That's it. it right? I could go sit with my wife, gotcha. um, <laughs> and I have. Um, <laughs> Soccer to me is the last player's game. It's the last player's game. Basketball is manipulated by the coaches. Football is manipulated by the coaches. The decisions that football and basketball coaches make during a game impact that game right now. I'm done. So all, we, all our work is during, during the week and practice. I'm done. A substitution isn't going to make a big difference in soccer. It does in basketball. You know, and, and so yes, we're done. We have to, the decision making, and this is one reason I, the NCAA I had an interview yesterday with them about something. And, and I told her, she said, what do your kids get out of the game? And I said, decision making. And the consequences that goes with decision making, which is different, in my opinion, than most sports. Most sports are controlled by the coach. So when the whistle blows, done, done. So that's why I don't yell at them. I mean, it doesn't matter. It, it, then I can see if I did a good job during the week. Are they ready to play and so on? It's, it's, it's almost uncanny because I, I had the opportunity to actually take Jay's class, his coaching leadership class. He, he failed. I, failed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have enough fun. But, but a couple, you know, go to a game, and it looks like he's reading a book on his eye. I, it's like total disinterest. The other story I, I want to quickly tell you, Andy, we'll get one more question if people will look. But, so I was at a game, you'll have to remember the game. Uh, might have been Dennison, by the way. That's the real coach that's yes, playing this problem. Yes, correct. But it was, it was tied right near the end, and uh, everybody's kind of, must have been about a minute left, everybody's kind of waiting to go to overtime. And all of a sudden, Colton gets right in front of the net, puts a header right in. Seven seconds left. Seven seconds left. I'm ready to go crazy, and I don't even know that much about I'm learning the sport. And you think, everybody's going to go crazy. They get up, game's over, Jay walks out and they start repairing the field. And I, everybody there wanted to, and it was, no, we're done. Let's yeah. repair the field. That's serious stuff. That's really serious yeah. stuff. I mean, we shook Dennison's hand, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, coaches or new managers about balancing the immediate results <laughs> I think that's a really good question, and, and, I, and I think I've had I, I think I've had the um, uh, uh, I think I've been able to do it over a period of time. Kind of as I said at the beginning, this all this has evolved. I didn't walk on a campus, and this wasn't how it is. But I think I think one of the most important things that you have to understand as a leader or a manager is that you are a role model and that your players or employees are reading everything that you do, everything that you do. So if you, if me, if I don't worry about the immediate future, after a while the guys aren't going to, I mean the immediate game, after a while the guys aren't going to. You've got to be a role model. That's why we lose a draw. I'm in the first one over to the other coach shaking hands right away, right away. Doesn't matter what the score was. That, that's what you do. So, and I've learned that the hard way because I've done some stupid things that players misread or misinterpreted that might have cost us a game or, or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But you've got to, that's why I'm, as Paul says, I'm, I don't really read a book on the sidelines, but I have a notebook. I write down things because I'm old and I can't remember things. So, um, but I think being a role model and modeling what you want the team or your group to be is, is really important. That's why I pick up the trash, as well as the players. That's why I do the laundry, as well as the players. I want to be a role model, a positive role model. Right? And, and um, does that help you at all? I mean, I think you've got to be true to yourself, and if you're true to yourself, then the, then the players will, will read that. Players are really good at reading coaches, very, very perceptive. The kids are really, really smart today. And, um, and so I, I, I think you've got to be you know, you've got to be on time, you've got to be consistent. I'm also a professor there, so I'm always on time to class. When the, when the guys walk into my class, I'm all set up, ready to go. This is business. 
See, I don't walk in late and set up. This is business. When my guys walk up to Roy Wright to, 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 for practice, the whole practice is all set up. This is business. So we go from this activity to that activity to that activity and go home. So that's what, what we do every single day. It takes a little effort. You know, some days you don't feel like going to class or going even to practice maybe, but you've you got to do it and you've got you've to stay consistent. That's my opinion. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I got to tell you, as a recovering soccer mom, um, I appreciate the fix this morning. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Anyway, for those of you who know me, um, and my son did play at Denison. But he never beat us. Once. I want you to know that. Once 2009. Oh, she remembers the day. <laughs> Anyway, so again, thanks for coming. Thanks for getting up this morning. This will be on our website next Tuesday. You'll get an email saying with a link um, there. So if you want to watch it, if you want to get all the books and all the information from there, you can do that. Um, we also have a list of values. So that if anyone, I know he talked a lot about values. If you want that list, email me, debbie at rossleadership.com. I'm happy to send that to you. We will skip June, so we will not be meeting in June. Our next one is July 21st, which is the third Tuesday in July, and Marsha Ryan will be your speaker. So we appreciate you coming. Have a great day, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. I've always felt when I used to, I used to walk around and look in the classroom, mm -hmm. I've never seen 